Thanks, Isa. Okay, welcome everyone um, to the workshop. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay. Everybody see that all right? Okay, so for anybody new who's joining us right now, if you want to drop your name and um, garden affiliation, if you have one in the chat, um, as well as your contact information, if you'd like to be added to our community garden network listserv, that would be great. Um, welcome to the community garden stories through metrics workshop. Um, this workshop is being hosted by Bountiful Cities Community Garden Network, um, and it's <clears throat> being made available through support from the city of Asheville. We have a contract with the Office of Sustainability, and they support all of our uh, free workshops. So my name is Nicole Heimbaugh. I am a program director for Bountiful Cities. Um, I've been with Bountiful Cities for six years now. Um, so my experience in the nonprofit realm includes that stint that I'm in currently right now, as well as an additional um, 10 plus years in nonprofit management at other nonprofits in the Asheville Buncombe County area. Bountiful Cities is an urban agriculture resource organization, so we provide support to community gardens and other kinds of urban ag projects um, in Asheville and Buncombe County. So today we're going to talk about metrics um, and how we use metrics with community gardening in order to tell our garden story. So we're going to cover, first of all, why would we use metrics? Why is that important or helpful? We're going to talk about how to use metrics. Um, we'll talk a little bit about data collection, data storage, data presentation and reporting. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about some ethical considerations. Um, and I'll share some helpful resources with you. And we'll wrap it up with a little Q&A. So first of all, why use metrics? Um, telling your garden story of progress and challenges. So when we are collecting information, numerical information to share out with stakeholders of different kinds, there are different reasons why we might wanna do that and reasons why using numbers can be really useful. Um, <clears throat> so think about when we are planning our gardens, um, using metrics is a good way to identify how much of anything we've done in order to plan for how much more we might wanna do this next year. So um, for an example, if we planted, let's say, 20 different varieties of plants in this year, um, and we would like to expand that next year to offer more variety, um, then next year maybe we'll plan to plant 40 different varieties. But being able to actually track that information is useful then for our planning purposes and also for evaluation to say how many of these varieties did well how many of the varieties didn't do well? Um, what can we learn from that information to support future planning efforts? Also, it's really great for community engagement. So as you're communicating out with your stakeholders uh, by email or newsletter or signage or any other kind of way, um, being able to actually tell the story of how many people are engaged in your garden, um, how many pounds of produce are being distributed by your garden, how many varieties are you growing in your garden and how has that changed over the years? Um, being able to tell that story of progress is useful and also being able to tell the story of your challenges. So maybe to say, hey, when we got started, we were actually uh, serving X number of people, you know, this number of pounds per week. But now, uh, due to the pandemic, we're finding that the demand has increased. And so we need more hands on deck to support labor, right? There's all different kinds of ways that actually tracking this information can be useful for your garden. And that includes fundraising and reporting. Um, some gardens are affiliated with nonprofit organizations or educational institutions. And so they're able to apply apply for grants, for example, on their own. 
And when you do apply for a grant, um, they definitely ask you your numerics. They wanna know what outcomes are you going to be able to achieve with the funding that they're going to potentially make available to you. So being able to track any of the different kinds of data that you wanna be able to track will then facilitate the process of you being able to secure funds um, through grant writing and then report out on the progress that you made as a result of their investment. It's also useful in other kinds of fundraising efforts beyond grant writing. I mean, if you're holding a fundraising event or you've got a fundraising campaign that's going on, it's really helpful to be able to say, right now our community garden is 100 square feet, let's say that's a very small community garden, but just for whatever, <laughs> the 100 square feet, we really want to double the size of our community garden, we want to triple the size of our community garden, we want to quadruple the size of our community garden, we want to have four 10 by 10 beds, and this is how much that's going to cost, we want to quadruple our square footage. So actually even knowing what that square footage is in the first place, and then tracking what happens um, <clears throat> with those investments can be useful. And then lastly, I want to talk a little bit about movement building. So you can see here, I've got a definition for you of movement building uh, from racialequitytools.org, which is a really cool site. They've got all kinds of other resources. Um, so according to their definition, mo movement building is the effort of social change agents to engage power holders and the broader society in addressing a systemic problem or injustice while promoting an alternative vision or solution. So how is this relevant? Um, as community gardeners, you are already part of a movement, <laughs> whether you know it or not. Um, and that is a movement toward food sovereignty, um, a movement based in food security and access to land and control of land, um, ownership of land, collective labor and collective decision-making and all those kinds of things. Community gardens are in the middle of a food justice movement right now. And one of the things that we've found uh, being engaged in food justice work is that we know, we know that community gardening is an effective strategy. It's an effective strategy to increase food access, especially in communities that are experiencing higher rates of food insecurity. But how do we know that? How are we actually telling the story of that being an effective strategy? One of the ways that is really helpful to tell that story is actually by recording what's happening from those gardens. How many people are receiving produce? With additional investments in this movement, in this work, in these strategies, how many more people are able to be fed? So I'm going to pause there and just ask if anybody has any questions. I can't really see everybody while I'm sharing my screen, but if you have any questions, please feel free to take yourself off mute and you can go ahead and ask. I have a question. Mm -hmm. and, oh, yes. Hey. <laughs> um, so, and maybe, I don't know if this is the right timing for it, but so we saw a significant decrease in our, well, first of all, through like organizational transition, we did not have as good recording of our numbers. Whereas in the past, we were very diligent about it. So our numbers are a little uh, not good just because like we didn't do good collection. And then the second thing is the numbers that we do have that are kind of guesstimates look really low comparatively. So like we usually track our volunteer hours and our produce numbers and so that's just more of like a donors relation question I guess is like do we, like how do we use our numbers to tell our story in a way that's helpful instead of donors being like wow you did a terrible job <laughs> like we don't want to give you any more money and like using that as a way to kind of pivot it to be like hey like we really saw that people weren't showing up in the garden and like that directly impacted our ability to grow as much food. And like, we'd really, to, in order to grow more food to get back to where we were before or more, we need support. So anyway, that's kind of like what's been going on for us right now. And I don't know if this is the right timing for that or like maybe a separate conversation, but just wanted to ask your thoughts. That's great. That. 
Yeah, that's great. Thank you for asking. That's a great question. So <clears throat> yeah, the kind of example that you were giving a, as part of your question is, is actually, I guess, part of the answer too, right? Because yeah, your, your numbers, first of all, establishing a baseline metric. So you, you mentioned that you had been tracking your information and then kind of got away from it. And now you're beginning again to track your information. So whenever you're beginning to track or, um, or starting again to track. That's called establishing a baseline metric. And that's to say that you're taking a snapshot, a point in time count basically of how is this garden operating? Um, and we're gonna talk in just a little bit about all the different things you could potentially track there, but whatever it is that you choose to track, you're recording whatever it is without judgment. It's just where you are, right? And then over the course of growing seasons and in future years, tracking that same information again is going to tell a story of progress or it could tell a story of challenges and both of those stories are really useful and relevant to funders because when you're telling a story of progress you might be telling a story of how investments in your work pay off right that's a story of growth it's a story of hey we're we're doing well please keep investing in us so we can continue to even do better um, when you're telling a story of challenge, then you're telling a story of, this is why we need funding. <laughs> we need funding, we need investment because these are the areas that we wanna make improvements in. We recognize that there are improvements to be made. We think we understand why, but we need some funds to be able to make that happen. So both of those are actually really useful. Does that uh, answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Any other questions for this for this section? Okay, and feel free to come off mute and ask questions really at any time. You don't have to wait for me to invite, okay? So next we're gonna talk a little bit about um, data collection. What, what data is it that you actually want to collect? So the way to answer that question um, is really most import importantly about what is important to you. How do you define success? So we know that there are all different kinds of community gardens, right? There are gardens that exist because many hands make light work and lots of neighbors come together and they grow food together in a space and they share that bounty, they share that harvest, right? Um, and so success for them might be uh, how much food are each of the families taking home or how many families are involved? Um, or how big is the garden that they're able to grow in? How much land are they utilizing for growth? And then we have gardens that exist for charitable distribution or at least have a charitable distribution aspect to their community garden. So they're growing food to be able to give to food pantries, for example, or to be able to donate at a weekly uh, roadside market or roadside stand. Um, maybe not the same people who are actively engaged in the garden, but people who need food. So then a measure of success in that way might be how many people have received food from this garden? How many pounds of food have been donated by this garden? Those are examples. Um, <clears throat> and then you have gardens that exist for educational purposes um, in order to support people, people's learning about how to grow food. They might be demonstration gardens. They might be affiliated with a university or a school. And so measures of success in those spaces might be more about how many people came to the garden for learning opportunities. Um, you know, how many people engaged in workshops in our garden? How many people put their hands in the dirt here? Uh, more so than maybe how many pounds of food were distributed. So that's the question you really wanna ask is what does success mean to us? What's important to us to collect? One way to think about it is um, people, plants, and pounds. Those are the three kind of main areas that you might think about when you're thinking about data collection. People, in terms of maybe the number of participants in your garden or the number of recipients of food. Plants, in terms of numbers of varieties of plants grown or even square footage of growing space. Um, and then pounds, how many pounds or boxes of produce have been distributed? Um, also, 
I want to just recommend participant satisfaction is another uh, measure of success. Um, it's another evaluation tool that you can use in your garden as well. And it's something that you can report back out on as well to funders and to other stakeholders. And I want to just ask here, do you all have other suggestions? Are there other things that you all measure or that you track in your garden that you might recommend? Um, I'll share that we, so we kind of do a combination of pounds and plants, you know, pounds of food to some donors and funders, you know, if they want to see that big number, but, you know, when you're equating root vegetables and winter squash with kale, you know, like that's very different. Like the serving size per pound is very different, right? Um, or the number of people that you feed, um, with a butternut squash, you know, five pounds of butternut squash is different than the number of people you feed with five pounds of kale. Um, and so we try to keep track of like, the one way we've done that is just by adding a category of like, which part of the plant is this? So is it the root that people are eating? Is it the leaf? Is it the fruit? Um, and that at least helps us kind of equate that pounds to serving size a little bit better, I guess. That's great. Thanks, Katie. Anyone else want to share about what kind of metrics you might be tracking in your garden? Something we do is we have groups who come out and we do an education on the root causes of hunger and then they work in the garden. Um, and so afterwards, we will ask them like, what did you learn? What, how was your experience here? And so that's kind of more like less numbers, but like really helpful to get feedback on to like, how was this experience? What did you learn? And so that has been really helpful for us and we can use that data for grant applications and stuff like that. Great, thanks Jess. Something that comes up uh, at Shiloh that um, are, is asked of us to record a lot in the grant reports is um, like the type of participant that comes out. So like how many students do you have? How many neighborhood residents? How many volunteers and what organizations are they from? Um, you know, like more specific, like how many elderly people, how like, you know, kinds of people that are involved in your project. And I feel like, especially with youth, that's something that comes up a lot in grant reporting that we do at the Shiloh Garden. Mm -hmm. So de demographics, especially, it sounds like. Thanks, Lydia. That's great. I'm, I'm curious um, if, and maybe you'll get to this, but if there are folks that are looking at collecting data, that's kind of that ripple effect. So, you know, people, plants and pounds really has to, is on an individual basis. But if we're looking, you know, an individual food security, but I'm wondering if anyone out there is doing anything to measure community food security. So like, what are those other elements that we're doing that are valuable that aren't kind of measured in those numbers? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, something to think about. That's great. Thanks, Katie. So on the end of food security measurements in general, like population level trends, um, <clears throat> health departments complete something called a CHA every, I think it's two years, which is called a community health assessment. And then they release the findings of their community health assessment. And that actually helps then to determine what kinds of priorities local health departments set um, to affect population level change in their kind of strategies and policies. And it actually can end up um, kind of dictating the policies of local funders as well, especially those that are funding in the area of social determinants of health. And so food security is one of the areas that the CHA addresses. Um, and they do that through a massive survey process um, that they collect that data and make it available. So you can find that locally here in Buncombe County through the Buncombe County Department of Health and Human uh, Services. And then also in other counties, the Departments of Health and Human Services should have that kind of population level, level data 
The census also tracks some level of data um, related to social vulnerabilities. Um, <clears throat> if you use, we just actually talked about this in a prior meeting today, but if you use um, ArcGIS software, um, you can actually access what's called a social, social vulnerability index, um, which is essentially uh, census data that is laid out to show which communities are experiencing vulnerabilities in different kinds of ways um, through the types of questions that are asked during the census process. Um, and then on the other side of things to see, well, where are we making changes like uh, collectively, how are we informing the solution? Uh, we are going to talk about that just a little bit. And that comes back to that idea of movement building. Um, but that's something that locally bountiful cities is definitely engaged in. And we um, would support other folks to be engaged as well. Thanks. Great question. So we're going to talk about how to collect the data. Um, once you identify what kind of data you want to collect. Um, so what is convenient to you? What is manageable for you, for your garden? And what is unintrusive to the people that you're working with? Um, so some examples uh, are things like, you know, sign-in sheets, doing a head count, um, using a whiteboard for people to sign in when they come into the garden, um, using scales, obviously, to measure poundage of food. Um, you can count the number of boxes um, and then kind of generally extrapolate what does a box of packed food weigh. <laughs> um, measurements of your garden for square footage. Um, you can collect this information in uh, planning documents. You can take photos. You can do surveys. There are all different kinds of things. One thing that I want to say about this, though, is um, estimates are OK. It does not need to be exact. It is OK to estimate. Um, as long as you are using the same type of data collection uh, method, basically, similar method each time that you're collecting that data um, to compare to your baseline, um, comparing estimates to estimates is okay. <laughs> it's kind of like comparing averages to averages, you know? Um, and if you want to get more exact with it, some folks really get very exact with it. That's okay too. That's more information. The other thing I want to mention is when we think about um, data collection being unintrusive, um, particularly when we start thinking about uh, something that was brought up earlier around demographics, um, <clears throat> There's some, some funders request a level of information about the people served by our programs that actually can be a bit intrusive. Um, it's one thing if you're recording people's ages, if they feel okay being asked that information, or if you're recording um, racial information, it starts to get a little bit more and more. There's kind of like a sliding scale of <laughs> discomfort um, when we start to ask our participants about their economic situations. Um, and then especially when we start to get into personal health questions. And there are a lot of funding providers who are really interested in seeing population level health outcomes. And so they will request that their funding recipients ask individual level health questions in order to demonstrate that type of outcome. I want to actually encourage people who are engaged in community gardens to push back on funders when they request that kind of information. Um, community gardeners are not doctors. Uh, we do not need to be requesting the weight of people who are receiving food. We don't need to be asking them about their mental health challenges unless that's useful for what's being provided. The point is, if a funder is asking you to collect data that you feel uncomfortable collecting, push back. Um, it is really only when we collectively push back against that, that that system is gonna change um, so that that is no longer something that's being required through funding. 
And sometimes we have to say, maybe this isn't a funder I want to work with. If you express your concerns and they're not agreeable to making those amendments and accommodations for the people you're working with, then that's an indication that your values are out of alignment with that funder. Um, lastly, on this slide, when do you actually collect the data? Who is responsible for collecting the data? These are just questions that you want to that you want to ask. Um, maybe depending on the type of data that you're collecting, it will be different. So maybe you're collecting sign-in sheets at every workday, um, or pounds distributed at every workday. Maybe you're only collecting data during um, garden planning, or maybe just at distributions, or every time someone comes into the garden, you want them to sign the whiteboard. It's, it's really, it's up to you, whatever makes the most sense for the type of data that you're collecting. Okay, and we're gonna talk a little bit too about data storage. So <clears throat> having digital storage in place is really useful um, so that you can quickly uh, access your information when you want, and so that you can replicate and share your information easily as well. So uh, Google Sheets are an option here for collecting your data and kind of tracking it over time. Um, spreadsheets are sometimes intimidating to some folks, but um, they also can be really helpful, really useful. And they actually have a lot of functions um, sort of within them that uh, once you learn some basics about how to use Google spreadsheets, um, they can be really, really useful to the type of data collection work that you might want to be doing. They're also shareable. So that's one thing about Google is it's free and it's shareable. So you can have your entire garden committee, for example, um, using your same spreadsheet and inputting data so that it's not just one person. And of course, Google Drive is also free and shareable, and that's a great place to keep your folders, uh, photos and things like that. You can also store data did, um, physically, like using the whiteboard or physical sign-in sheets, printed surveys, um, printed photos, those kinds of things. Of course, those are easier to lose or misplace. And in many cases, you still need to translate those um, to a digital version uh, for reporting purposes. Um, but also, it's helpful to have uh, photos, photo collections, because one of the things you can do to communicate with your stakeholders um, is create photo albums, for example. Uh, photo albums are a great way when you're tabling, especially to be able to tell the story of your garden. So um, I'm going to come back real quick here. I'm going to pop out of here and I'm going to come into this. So here is an example of a Google Sheet. Many of you have probably already seen these before. This is a Google Sheet that we have um, for the purpose of collecting community garden data from across gardens located within Asheville and Buncombe County. And that is to establish a kind of collective baseline and also to be able to tell the story of change over time, to be able to say, okay, so we've been putting you know x number of thousands of dollars for example into infrastructure improvements um, into these different gardens in these neighborhoods and this is what we're observing as far as change over time um, and of course we're not going to ask folks to report out on all of these different areas we're letting people really select what makes the most sense for them what is easiest and unintrusive for them to be able to collect. And then we're gonna provide some support for that collection as well. But I just wanted to show you this because this is one way to track information. So you can see here, we've got community garden name, garden location, contact information. And then here's estimated square foot of growing space, estimated number of varieties, people involved, recipients, and pounds distributed. And we've got that uh, ready to go to track across several different growing seasons so that we can start to see what kind of changes might be uh, taking place for gardens. And this is something we're just going to begin to institute. One thing I wanna show you quickly about this is that there's a way within Google Sheets right here with view, you see freeze, 
that you can freeze rows and columns so that if you are tracking information, whether it's a lot of different data points or over a long period of time, um, you can freeze your column so that things don't move when you move in that direction and you can freeze your rows to keep your headings the same there so that you can always see kind of where you are. So I just wanna show you that real quick. Okay, so we're gonna go back in here. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about data presentation. <clears throat> so infographics are one way to be able to present your data in order to tell your story in a visual way. Um, some examples of infographics are those that you can obtain through Google Forms. Google Forms automatically create infographics of your data. So especially if you're administering surveys uh, to your participants, that's a really effective way, an easy way to have sort of instant infographics available. And you can also translate that information quickly and easily into Google Sheets. And I'll show you that in just a minute. The other thing is that Google Sheets themselves have the ability to be able to create charts and infographics from data sets within the within the Google Sheets. And of course, you can present your data in lists or tables or stories, um, however you want. So here are a couple of examples of what Google form charts look like. So uh, here you can see up at the top, we've got um, a question that we asked a bunch of gardeners um, about whether their garden is located within city limits or not. We had 14 responses, and so Google very helpfully created this nice little pie chart for us automatically based on the responses. Here's another uh, response, uh, another infographic that was created from the responses to our um, Google form that Google created automatically. So in this case, we asked, what information would you be interested in tracking for your specific garden site? Um, select all types, and here it created a handy um, little chart for us to show how many respondents said that they would be interested or willing to track different types of data. Here's some examples of the types of infographics that can be generated through Google Sheets. Um, on the left here is another question we asked in that same survey of what kind of support or materials would you need from the Community Garden Network in order to record the data that you said you would like to um, track. And so you can see here that people answered maybe a dry erase board or technical support or materials um, or scales. And this has broken it out into a pie chart based on those responses. Over here, you can see some more examples of Google generated, uh, Google sheet generated charts that were used actually from a different, a different sheet. So I'm gonna come out of here real quick and demonstrate how to do this. So first we're going to come into a Google form. Okay, so this is that same annual food production data collection preferences Google form that I was just referencing. We had 14 respondents. There's that pie chart that we just looked at. Um, we also asked some questions about what would be helpful for you to be able to collect this data. Here are the responses there. So you can see how Google Form is automatically through the, um, the summary tab up here at the top, the summary tab, it's automatically collating that information for us in order to make it um, readable and easily accessible in that way. Um, and then you can copy that chart you see when I scroll over the upper right hand corner of any one of these, you can actually copy the chart and you can paste it into other documents and things like that. So that's really pretty helpful. But let's say that you want to create a different kind of chart from that data. Um, <clears throat> so up here at the very top of your Google form, you'll see that there's a little Google Sheet icon. So if you click that Google Sheet icon, 
it will automatically generate for you um, a Google Sheet that has all of the questions that you asked across the top, and it has all of the respondents' answers um, on a single uh, row for each respondent. This is really helpful because you can add columns to this automatically generated Google Sheet in order to compare data sets over time. Um, you also can make this a form that people use ongoing over a long period of time. And as people continue to add their answers to the form, the Google Sheet that you've created from that will automatically add those answers into the sheet. So it's automated. You do not have to manually enter that information. So now I'm going to show you a little bit um, just Briefly, I am not an expert in this area, but I encourage you to play with it and uh, see what you can figure out, what you can learn. I'm gonna show you how to create um, an infographic, a chart using a Google Sheet. So I'm gonna highlight a particular data set. I'm gonna highlight this data set here that says, uh, what information would you be willing to collect? So I've highlighted that column, and now I'm going to come up here and I'm going to click this little icon right there that says insert chart. It automatically created a chart for me. So this is a pie chart. Um, do I want to use a pie chart? I could use other kinds of charts. So I, could, I just clicked over here where it says chart editor. Um, there's setup and customize. If I wanna keep the pie chart, I can customize that pie chart in different kinds of ways. But if I want to use a different kind of chart, then I would just scroll down here where it says chart type, hit the little drop down menu and select something else. So all of these different kinds of charts are available right here in the Google Sheet. Um, let's say that we wanna use this kind of chart type, column chart. So you can see it automatically adjusted the chart. Maybe we wanna use this kind of chart. <laughs> Okay, so you can see that you can really, um, you can really play around with this. Um, now, for my purposes, maybe it's not very helpful to have a chart right in the middle of my Google Sheet. <laughs> so um, I can come over here to the little three dots. And I can copy the chart. And I can stick it somewhere else, wherever I want. And if I don't want it there at all, I can just delete the chart. I can download the chart as an image or as a PDF document or a vector graphic. So this is how you can use Google Sheets to pretty quickly and easily conveniently um, create an infographic from different data sets that you might be collecting and storing. So anyone have any questions about that? Anybody have any other suggestions about how to use different tools for infographic development? We're gonna talk about Canva in just a little bit, but anybody have any other kinds of suggestions? I don't have a uh, suggestion, but I do have a question. <clears throat> um, uh, in terms of like trying to gauge impact, um, uh, like how many people were, were feeding, I guess, is, is kind of something I've found hard to, to keep track of because we, we, so we donate a majority of our produce to different partners who then distribute it to people that are hungry. Um, and so, yeah, just trying, I don't, I, I'm trying to, you know, of course I can figure out how many people those partners serve, but but that would be probably a lot more than what our specific community garden is serving. So it's hard for me to understand how to, to track our impact exactly. That's a great question. So one way that you could potentially track that um, is kind of thinking about what was mentioned earlier in terms of 
identifying serving size. Um, so if you're tracking the kind of pounds that are being distributed to the partner agencies that are actually engaged in the distribution, one question that you could ask your partner agencies is when they distribute the food, how many pounds is that usually per person? How much food, and particularly maybe produce, um, is being distributed? How much of it is being distributed to each person, approximately? And then what you can do is you can take the total amount of poundage that you're sending to your partners, you can divide it by that number of what typically goes out to each individual recipient, and that will give you an estimate for approximately how many people your produce uh, distribution is serving. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments on this section? Okay. So um, next we're gonna talk just briefly about how to use metrics to tell your story in terms of data reporting. So different ways that you can get that information and all those cool new infographics. <laughs> that now you're going to be able to create um, out to your stakeholders. Um, maybe you want to do it in the form of a, of a newsletter that goes out monthly or quarterly or once a growing season or something like that. Maybe you actually host a website. Um, maybe you just do an annual report. So you can see here an example of a worldwide crop annual report. And this is um, an infographic heavy annual report, which a lot of reports are going toward now. And I'm gonna show you in just a minute, a tool that you can use to create something like that uh, pretty easily. Um, maybe you wanna share this information, your infographics or other ways that you're collecting and, and um, storing your data uh, over social media. Certainly we talked about grant applications, um, funder invoicing, and then we also talked about that shared database. That's a really useful way to identify how we're making change on a local level. Kind of track the movement. <laughs> so let's talk about some ethical considerations. So when you are collecting data, and we, we've touched on this just a little bit, but we're gonna talk about it some more. Um, when you're collecting data, uh, you might be collecting data about people or about plants. Um, when you're collecting data about people, it's important not to veer into the realm of exploitation. So what does that mean? Um, think about when you're collecting your data, whose story you're actually telling. And sometimes literally telling a story. This is something that funders ask for a lot. It's also something that... Um, uh, people use a lot in their newsletters and things like that. It's really effective to tell the story of somebody who you are working with in your garden, somebody who's benefiting from the work that you do. However, um, telling that story, telling our story by telling someone else's story um, can cross over into the land of exploitation if we do not have permission to share their story. So you always want to have that permission in advance, especially to know if you're allowed to use their name and if, if they're comfortable with you sharing their experience. Because if they believe that they're having a private experience that suddenly becomes public, that's exploitative. Also, when you're taking photos in your garden, um, who are you depicting in your photos? Do you have permission to use their image? Uh, it's a good idea to have um, photo permissions available, uh, which is like a form that people can fill out that says, yes, I give permission for you to use my image in these kind of specific ways. Um, and if you don't really have that, and if you haven't talked with folks about that, it's a good idea to not use photos that feature people's faces. Um, if you have, generally speaking, if you have just the backs of people or just their feet or just their hands or something like that, that's kind of a different situation. But if you are showing people's faces, do be sure that you have permission to use their image. And then also, are you presenting an accurate representation of participation in your garden? Um, <clears throat> for example, 
many nonprofit organizations, especially um, for funding purposes and also just mission-based work, really focus on, for example, communities of color uh, in order to prioritize their services and resources and things like that. And while there's nothing wrong with that inherently, we need to be really careful about then how we're telling the stories of our services. Um, so when you are taking photos of your garden workshops or your garden work days and things like that, and then displaying those photos on your website, uh, in your newsletter, do you always have the one person of color who, keep, who comes to the garden depicted in every photo as a way to say, hey, we're inclusive here. We have diversity with, among our participants. Um, is that really an accurate representation of the participants in your garden? So that can also kind of veer into the realm of exploitation um, if you're kind of disproportionately uh, presenting a picture of people who are using your gardener services um, that is actually out of alignment with, with, who's, with the reality. And then on the other end of things, what if people are asking you for your data? like us, <laughs> like Bountiful Cities, for example. We're gonna be asking local gardens to, um, to submit data if they are comfortable with it and with whatever kind of support they need, um, including compensation if, that's, uh, if that is useful and requested. But let's think about if other folks are asking you to submit your data, is your time and energy being valued? Um, are you, are you informing someone else's story? Um, is there reciprocity there? So this is sort of ensuring that you also are not being exploited <laughs> in someone else's storytelling through the use of your data. So I just wanna pause there for a second and see if anybody else has any kind of ethical considerations that they wanna share with the group when we're thinking about data collection and also um, sharing and reporting. Something that I, so I was telling you all about how we'll often have groups come out and we do education with them and then we work in the garden and then at the end we'll do kind of like a survey where I'm asking folks about what their experience was like and so I, I like to and I want to be more intentional about this this year as well but when I'm saying like hey can I ask you all to give some feedback telling them why am I asking for that information and telling them like hey like we this is really helpful for us to like understand what your impact is and to like change the work we're doing and also we use this to help us get funding and so I think that's something that I've I really learned is like not only asking for permission but it's also like informing people what are we doing with that so that people can really make an informed decision because I think in some situations someone will be like yeah you can take a picture and then other situations are like wait I didn't know you were going to put that on your website and like blast that through your social media but so that's something I want to definitely like work on doing better is like informing as to why am I like why is that useful for us and how are we using that. That's great. Thanks, Jess. And that's a really important point, too, about just exactly how those photos are going to be used. If you do have a photo release form that you use um, when you're taking pictures around your garden, maybe one way to kind of address that is to list out um, all the different kinds of ways that those photos might be used and allow people to opt in to the things that they're comfortable with so that you're not inadvertently using photos in a way that they aren't maybe really comfortable with. Um, in other words, signing a, a photo release shouldn't necessarily give you blanket permission to use their photo however you want. But as Jess says, getting really kind of maybe granular with that to say, well, these are the different ways it might be used. What are you comfortable with? That's a great point, Jess. Anyone else have anything to contribute to this section? Okay, so now I'm just gonna share with you all some resources. 
Um, when we're talking about <clears throat> the type of data collection that takes place here in Buncombe County, um, that Bountiful Cities is going to be supporting local community gardens, the types of resources that we have available to offer. Um, we can offer technical assistance. Um, we offer grant writing and fund distribution um, to local gardens. We can purchase equipment for your data collection. So let's say um, you're a local garden and you would like to be able to measure the number of pounds of food that are being distributed, but you just don't have a scale. Uh, we can purchase a scale for you. Um, we can also support with data compilation and analysis, so we can kind of serve, as I showed you all before, uh, that Google Sheet, we can kind of serve as a, a space where we're collecting that data for everybody. So maybe instead of having to collect it year over year over year uh, for your own garden, you could share that information once a year with us and we'll store it for you. We'll manage that data space for you and also make it accessible to you. Um, and of course we do funder reporting as well. So those are things that we can, um, that we can provide support related to uh, data collection and sharing. Um, as far as the work that you all are doing independently, here are some helpful tools. Um, so I'm gonna actually demonstrate each of those. I'm gonna pop out of here for in just a second um, to show you what these all look like. But North Carolina State Extension um, has created uh, on their website a whole page about the benefits of community gardens. Um, they have compiled a bunch of different studies that demonstrate the effectiveness of community gardening as a strategy um, to work on issues such as food access, for example. Um, and then there's an evaluation toolkit that I'm gonna share with you. It's a real big toolkit, but chapter five is all about community gardens. And so they've got some sample forms and things in there, some templates that you can use if you'd like. There's another uh, data collection toolkit called farmingconcrete.org. I'll show you that really quick. Um, you might find some useful resources in there. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about Canva as well. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, workshop, uh, I'm going to make the PDF of this workshop, this presentation available to everybody who participates um, because you can, it's clickable. You can click through the links to be able to get there directly. So let's come out of here and we'll take a look at some of these resources. There we go. So first we have, this is Canva. So Canva is a graphic design platform that is pretty user-friendly and there's a paid version of it. And there's also a free version of it. Oh, Jess just asked, is there somewhere we can access these links? Yes, Jess. So this presentation is going to be sent out on PDF by PDF, and you'll be able to access those links um, directly through there. So Canva is a design platform that you can use either a free version or you can use a paid version. Um, here you can see this is the kind of landing page for Canva. It says start your free pro trial. So if you pay for Canva Pro, that's a, a paid version and you have access to a lot more kind of um, information and templates and things like that, you can also use the free version. And I'll just say that um, at our organization, we use the free version of Canva and it's been great. We've been able to do so much stuff with it. So I'm just gonna scroll down a little bit and you'll see some examples of different things that you can create with Canva. And then this is the, the pro here, uh, $12.99 a month uh, for up to five people. So um, you can create flyers, you can create um, newsletters, um, all kinds of infographics. Uh, there's lots of different kinds of templates that you can access here. So 
Um, so one of the questions is, can I use Canva for free? Yes, you can use Canva for free. You can upgrade to Canva Pro if you want, but you can also just use it for free. So this is a platform that we recommend checking out. <clears throat> it's really user-friendly and you can share your designs with your entire, with your team as well. Even on the free version, you can share it with people to come in and actually co-create together and work on, work on designs together. So this is Canva Pro. Um, there is a cost associated with this, but because you can have multiple users on it, this is something that might even be worthwhile um, for people across organizations or across gardens to actually come together and you know pay $12 a month or whatever it is, $12.99 a month in order to access these templates. So that um, annual report that I showed you earlier on an earlier slide, that you can create in Canva Pro. They have a gajillion, they've got thousands of templates um, that you can use uh, to create charts, create infographics of all different kinds, um, and to create those kind of really cool looking annual reports and things that are infographic heavy. They've got so many different kinds of options. And as I, as I said before, it's pretty user-friendly. So that's a tool. This is the Farming Concrete Data Collection Toolkit, Methods for Measuring the Outcomes and Impacts of Community Gardens and Urban Farms. Now, this is a massive toolkit. Um, I'm just going to scroll down here to the table of contents so you can see what's included. And then feel free to um, explore this further uh, once I send you all the PDF with the links. So food production data, environmental data, social data, health data. This is all about different kinds of data you might want to collect and how to collect it. That's really what this whole toolkit is about. Farming concrete data collection toolkit. Next we have, um, this is the NESF uh, let's see, I'm on page 130. I'll come back here so I can show you the title page. This is the Community Food Project Evaluation Toolkit uh, from the Community Food Security Coalition. So um, this was sponsored by the USDA. Here's an overview. I'm just going to scan to the table of contents really quick. So here's the table of contents. So you can see this is also a very, very long report. It's a big tool <laughs> with the appendices. It's uh, 293 pages long, so it's big. But chapter five here that starts on page 121 is all about community gardens, community garden tools. And there's all kinds of other tools here too, y'all. There's satisfaction surveys, focus groups and interviews, farmers market tools, uh, farm to school tools, CSA tools, etc. So I'm gonna go ahead though and jump down here. Okay. So, we're still on market. <clears throat> There's a whole lot of scrolling, y'all. Okay, chapter five, community garden tools. So here you can see what kind of tools they make available for you. Uh, data collection worksheet, survey for adults, a survey for youth, um, a tracking form for attendance and participation, produce, garden characteristics. I went through all this and I do find it to be a little... Uh, data heavy, I'll say. <laughs> um, these templates are available for your use. They also ask questions that are maybe more in depth than what your garden might be looking for. But if you are looking to collect this level of data, then here are some helpful tools to be able to do that. And they tell you how to administer the tools as well. So this is an example of a community gardener survey for adults. It's a lot. Um, there's a community garden survey for youth. And the kinds of questions are how often do you participate? What do you like most or least about coming to the garden? Um, rate the following aspects of working at the garden. It's it's a lot of it's a lot of data here. 
Um, this is an attendance and participation tracking form. So this might be pretty useful. Um, so name, time in, time out, total time spent in the garden and activities completed. Uh, if you want to be able to track who's coming in and out of your garden for work days and things like that. Here's an overview tracking form for produce. So pounds of food distributed to sell, total number of pounds, uh, pounds of food donated, pounds of food used by garden participants and their families. So many community gardens actually employ uh, a bunch of different kinds of um, activities within their gardens that are not just exclusively charitable growing or exclusively um, you know, community growing, but actually have components of all of these things. And so these are some tools for how to track uh, the produce and where it's going. Um, considering that there might be all different kinds of activities taking place. Garden characteristics. So here we can see number of acres or square feet gardened, number of gardeners or volunteers. So I just wanted to show you that as a tool. And then finally, we're gonna take a look at the North Carolina State Extension. So this community gardens page is a helpful resource as you are writing grants, as you're communicating your data out to various kinds of stakeholders, you might wanna do a little compare and contrast to say, hey, here's the problem, here's the, the situation, um, here's a solution. Or this has been demonstrated to be an effective strategy and here's how we're doing it. You know, um, So here you can see they've got information collected about nutrition. So for example, Adults with a household member who participated in a community garden consumed fruits and vegetables 1.4 times more times per day than those who did not participate. And they were 3.5 times more likely to consume fruits and vegetables at least five times daily. So when you're working with different funders who have the sort of um, <clears throat> social determinants of health based outcomes and they want to know, are you supporting the increase of eating healthy, you know, consuming fresh fruits and vegetables, then you can point to community gardening as a strategy for participants um, consuming more fruits and vegetables. And just to speak earlier about the kind of intrusive nature of questions that you might or might not ask, one way that you can kind of demonstrate that um, the strategy that you're employing, such as community gardening, has an effect um, on things like increasing the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables without actually having to ask your participants those questions is you can point to the stu studies and surveys that have already been conducted that already show that to be typically true. Um, not every funder loves that, <laughs> but it is definitely an option. It's an option to explore. Um, so these are barriers to fruit and vegetable intake. They're talking about that. Again, community gardeners consumed fruits and vegetables 5.7 times per day compared with home gardeners. More nutrition. Um, beautifying urban neighborhoods. There's all different kinds of qualitative case study information that's available here. Community development. Stress relief all kinds of benefits, all of these benefits of community gardens, all these studies that have been done to demonstrate the benefits of community gardens. So that grant question that you get asked that says, what is the problem that you're trying to solve and why is your solution a demonstrated effective solution? Here's a place that you can go to find that information. So I'm gonna come back here. and open it up for Q&A. Anybody have any kind of general questions um, about what we've been talking about so far or any kind of comments, things that you might like to add? Well, if you ever do have questions and you'd like a little more information about the kinds of things we've been talking about or other kinds of things related to community growing and urban agriculture practices, this is how you can get 
in touch with the staff at Bountiful Cities. And this is not all the staff at Bountiful Cities, but these are people who are leading the different programs that might be useful to be in touch with. So thank you everyone for participating um, in this workshop today. Uh, I appreciate you and good luck on all of your community growing efforts. Thanks, Thank Nicole. You, Nicole. Um, I actually did want to ask a question. Um, so I live in the Weekend neighborhood, and we have been going for a couple years now with our garden, but um, I don't think we've really collected data in the past. And so I've been kind of tagged with starting this. And um, I really, this is helpful because I didn't really know where to start with collecting any data. And it seems like um, even just collecting number of people and you know different types of foods that are grown like could be really supportive um, for us in the future. Um, so anyways, I was just, I didn't really have a question as much as just thank you. Like I think all these resources are helpful for me to kind of maybe dive into and figure out what will be supportive. And um, while you were talking, I was, making a Google form and um, I was on Canva and found out I can, um, if any of you are educators, I didn't know this, but you can, there's, you can get pro for free. Um, oh, that's so great. now I have a Canva pro account. And uh, anyway, so I just wanted to say thank you because I think those tools could be really helpful. Great, thank you so much. Glad that you're here. Thanks, Lynn. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Katie. Um, yeah, I'm also just, I'm grateful. A lot of this was um, review, but just good to know that we're on the right track. I think uh, we've had some folks who've been really de dedicated with data collection in the past. And so I'm glad to see that we're, we're using the useful tools, um, but there were some new things and I appreciate that. And um, I guess I'm just curious, you know, as we push the conversation further out, you know, there's so much value to community gardens that can't really be measured in numbers. And so I'd love to participate in conversations around how do we kind of hard, harvest and harness that um, and be able to kind of shift what funders might be looking for. You know, what are the ways that we can measure the more qualitative aspects um, of it, what it is that we do in relationships and things like that. That's great. Thanks, Katie. I have to agree with you, Katie, um, because I, when I when you asked, like, what is it that we value or what is it that we want to know? I was like, well, I can't measure the fact that, like, when I go out there, I talk to my neighbors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's those connections that, like, you know, there are people I've met in the community garden that I've never talked to otherwise because I don't cross them. Mm -hmm. So I think that is important. I think, like, finding ways to get someone to, like, tell the story of some of that. Um, qualitative information. Um, it just made me think at the end of last year, we we wrote like a, a little like report on like how the garden went this year and things like that. But even then you don't, you can't capture all of that beautiful, all that beautiful, the beautiful moments that happen when you connect, mm. which I think, you know, at least for my neighborhood, it, the, our community garden is really about connection. Thanks, 